the Zelensky Show for this Monday, August 15, 2016 edition. I broadcast weekdays at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. That's Monday to Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time right here on WINB. And, of course, to find out more ways to listen, including the podcast, the customized iPhone app, and now we've got the app for Android. So do go and look for the Weekend Vigilante app. Well, Power Prayers, Warfare That Works, exciting new book of mine is out this month. Please be patient. It's going to be worth the wait. It's coming out any day now, and I'm very excited to get this book in your hands. To pre-order your copy, go to WeekendVigilante.com. Click on the book picture. It says Power Prayers and secure your copy today. I'm very excited about that. Well, let's jump right into the show. My guest is Jim Willie from GoldenJackass.com. He was on the show about a month ago, and it was a very popular show, and it is great to have him back to weigh in on the insanity unfolding. Not even looming anymore. It's unfolding before us. Jim Willie, great to have you back on the program. Welcome, sir. Oh, it's a good to be back, Sheila. And, uh, you know, as usual, I, I keep saying this with almost all the interviews. So much has happened since the last time we talked. We're, we're, this is the quickening. We're, we're having an acceleration of important events, not just events, but important events that, that are shaping the world and, and reshaping the geopolitical structures that run the world. And, and this Turkish situation and the British situation, these are, you know, dire you know, the, the big stories and the, the big themes like the Clinton Foundation. The Clinton Foundation, in my opinion, is, is the source of the problem. And a lot of what's going on with Hillary requires those involved in the Clinton Foundation corruption to protect themselves and to protect their dog. Their dog is Hillary. And, and the Clinton Foundation, I think, involves something like 30 important offices of the U.S. government and maybe as many as two to 300 people all skimming millions, if not billions, from peddling U.S. data, U.S. intelligence, U.S. weapons, U.S. uranium, and more. The Clinton Foundation is the entire nexus for the U.S. government systemic ingrained corruption. And that's why you will never see it prosecuted. For instance, Comey, the FBI director, he's not going to slam the the, uh, Clinton Foundation. He was in charge of the HSBC legal staff in London. Right. And they had they had to fend off the narcotics money laundering issues. So er, er, you can't have someone prosecute when that person is involved. So you're not going to see the Clinton Foundation fall apart. You're going to see the entire U.S. government and its debt situation and its currency structures all fall apart because of no remedy. And and this is going to be tragic, and I I hope we don't end up with a world war, and I think we're going to see a, a number of important collapses in the next several months. It's it's not probably going to happen in a way that many expect. I I think we're going to start seeing more and more actual boycotts where nations say, we don't want your dollar. We we don't want to be paid in your dollar. We don't want your treasury bond because you've turned it into a Zimbabwe currency. I just got an email. This is fascinating, Sheila, but I get contact us email, but I also get client and follower email. If someone sent me a few messages several months ago and not being a client, using contact us the several responses i gave and enabled the person to make a new comment to me directly with my email i just got an email from somebody i believe it was a client and it was a client from north dakota north, north dakota sorry it was about bobcat corporation you know that, that makes the they're not i call them a, a small time caterpillar um, they make industrial equipment like forklifts right. and little scoopers, not, not for making roads, but for digging a trench where a sewer line's coming in. Okay, Bobcat. They're having a problem now. They're, they have a parent organization in South Korea. So, you know, we lost that company to a, 
an Asian larger company. Okay, well, more colonization. But the important point that was brought to my attention was Bobcat is now shipping in their machines, you know, like the Bobcat scooper. But the point was that the shipped machinery coming into the West Coast is being held up. I don't mean like gunpoint and you know robberies. I mean it's being delayed to unload because they don't want treasury bills. We're getting concrete examples. The message to me came in. Jim, I heard you talk about how port facilities are seeing more and more examples of treasury bills being refused for payment. Here's a concrete example with Bobcat. Okay, this is one more. I think in the next several months, there'll be a dozen. They're starting to refuse treasury bonds as a legitimate form of money because we're printing it like Zimbabwe. We, we're calling it stimulus, Sheila. Yeah. It's not. It's killing capital, undermining the whole payment structure system, backdoor Wall Street bailouts for worthless, toxic, impaired bonds that no one wants to buy. Absolutely. So where's the stimulus? It's not. It's contamination. So we're going to invite, and it's, it's accelerating, the, the whole world. I'm looking for where the fractures are going to take place for bringing about the actual end to the global dollar. And I, I think it's going to be trade payments, and I'm now starting to think it's also going to be the treasury bond complex itself. Well, I don't have to tell you, Jim, this has been a wild year with, of course, we know gold up the most in 36 years. Probably the biggest year-to-date performance in 36 years has just occurred over the last few months. We've got mining shares in blast-off mode. I mean, what surprises you the most in this kind of short time period since about April? Since April? Um... I think the turns in Turkey and Germany. I, I'm focusing internationally a lot. I try to look a lot at what's going on in the bond market, the treasury bond market. And now I'm starting to watch all the major bond markets. The German Bund has a problem. The British Gilt has a problem. The U.S. Treasury has a problem. But internationally, I think that the turning point linchpin countries of Turkey and Germany are getting fed up with the U.S. masters. And this is what's surprising me. Bond markets, not just ours, but the sovereign major bond markets, and many call them vassal states, uh, Japan, Germany, Turkey. They do what we tell them or we kill them. Right. The number of murders is astonishing. I mean, you can focus on the Hillary murders, and I think there's six since May, but very few people focus on the Brazil murder of Eduardo Campo a year and a half ago. He was a moderate presidential candidate that the U.S. did not want. So he had a small plane. He didn't get out of it because it crashed. And, and here's one of the telling indicators. There was a pro-Washington person, a Brazilian leader, who was going with Campo. And he decided at the last minute, might, might have been a woman, that, that person, that leader, decided at the last minute, no, oh, not going on that flight. Why not? Change of plan. What kind of change of plan? Oh, we're not told. The plane crashed. Campo died. The other person didn't. Now that other person is vying for president of, Ger of Brazil with U.S. blessing. These are the hints of a murder hit at the state level. And, and the U.S. is all over, all over doing things. I, gosh, I think there have been about 30 key murders in the last 20 years in South America of just people who got in the way of the U.S. plans in our backyard. But and I'm focusing on a lot of things, Sheila. I, I, I don't focus on everything. I don't have enough time. But uh, I really think Turkey and Germany are turning points. Germany is going to be extraordinarily difficult for their leaders and their people and their industrial captains to change course. Well, the American economy is living on borrowed time. I think we know that. We've got the infusion of massive amounts of printed out of thin air cash being printed by the Fed. I mean, anyone with an IQ above room temperature knows the inevitable economic 
crash is looming just on the horizon. We know the deficit's what, 20 trillion, soon to be 21 trillion dollars. And that's the good news. I mean, the unfunded liabilities debt is estimated to be 240 trillion dollars. You look at the derivatives, we've been saddled with the burden of what, paying through the infamous bailouts, that's what, $1.5 quadrillion? I mean, it is really mind-numbing what's happened, isn't it? It's mind-numbing, but when, when people ask me, when do, they, when do I think the crash is going to take place, I, I say, right after the Lehman Brothers incident. We've been in crash mode for eight years. You, you can say, well, we're heading toward a crash. No, I'm, I say, we're in a crash. Would you like 20 examples? Take a look at the freight index, electricity usage. Take a look at my favorite economic statistic that's that intentionally held back a lot. Corporation withheld income tax. You can't fudge that. Tax withholdings. You can't fudge it. You can't fake it. You can't say, well, wait a minute, we're, we're going to do some adjustments on that. No, you just look at it from year to year. And it's gone down about 20% in the last several years. Okay, we're in a crash now. You take a look at, it's not just freight. Take a look at trucking. Yeah, data. you know, listen, trucking. I'm so glad you brought that up. I was talking to a head of truck shipments in America, and he said shipments in June, Jim, were down so bad. He said it was absolutely mind-numbing. So I'm really glad you brought that up because they continue to dive, don't they? They, they do, and, and it, it's evident evidence of the economy already in crash mode. You could take a look at uh, container vessels. This is another favorite of mine. Containers on shipping vessels. They're way down. But here's the extraordinary statistic. Last year, 2015, the United States exported, you know, back to Asian or emerging market nation ports. We exported 500,000 empty containers wow. to go back and get filled again. We're, we don't make much here. We make, you know, weapons. We make laced vaccines that contain the actual virus. We make fraudulent bonds. What do we make here? McDonald's? I, th my, the <laughs> voice has a joke. He said, Jim, one of the major exports from the United States is diabetes. <laughs> McDiabetes. We're not loving it. <laughs> it. It's it's funny. I know it's funny, but what does that mean, Jim? Say the stupid guys in the corner. Well, it means that the fast food and the French fries are being exported all over the place by means of uh, you know the franchise. I mean, we used to have Wendy's here in Costa Rica. I didn't like their hamburgers. I liked their frosty. They they made a tremendous little milkshake. There was chocolate and it had little, you know, tiny micro ice bits in there. It was the best milkshake in, in all the town. They shut down all the Wendy's. But, we, you know, we still got McDonald's. And, by the way, McDonald's in Costa Rica is far superior to the McDonald's elsewhere. Oh, they got much higher quality hamburger. They don't use, you know. Human uh, meat? Well, beef bones and, and human parts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, we're getting off course here, but I truly believe Turkey is a gigantic turning point story. And and I, I just, you know, an hour ago finished a chapter that featured a lot of the Turkish-Russian interplay. Uh, the United States tried to get a coup. It, it wasn't just the United States, it was elements friendly to the United States that we're working with because we love terrorism so much in Washington. And they, this group, ISIS, is really good at it because we train them in the East Coast U.S. military bases. We don't just organize these people and fund them through, you know, Saudi and Israeli sources and arm them. No, we bring them to the United States to train them. And Obama's being outed for this, and it's exciting to see. But we, we had a failed coup, and I, I forecasted six and eight months ago a coup d'etat in the Turkish government. And I said the result will be the nation turns eastward. I didn't expect it to be a failed coup and Erdogan to turn eastward with an apology and olive branch 
to the Kremlin, I didn't expect that. I just expected the main elements, a coup and a turn east, and we got it. Well, and then Turkey is threatened to back out of an agreement to stem the flow of migrants to the European Union if Turkish nationals aren't granted visa-free travel to the bloc. So, in, in other words, Europe's trapped kind of in a no-win situation. Europe officials are saying that although Turkey has fulfilled most of these conditions, it's failed to relax the most stringent anti-terrorism laws. So essentially, and I was looking at this really interesting German newspaper article on Friday, and it has this confidential plan to house all migrants arriving from Turkey on Greek islands. Like, there's a lot of shady shenanigans going on in Turkey, isn't there? There is, and I think Putin is, is like the big guy coming up with some industrial cleaners and, and brooms. He's coming in there, and, and he is ISIS worst enemy yeah and by cleaning up so much in Syria he's exposed the United States and very few Americans know this but in the last September G20 meeting Putin gave a PowerPoint show of the complex financing pathways for Isis and they're all from Israel and the Swiss banks not get any press in the United States Putin in the G20 exposed the West as being funding agents for ISIS and the terrorism. And furthermore, John McCain got his email hacked. In the hacking came a lot of different mail, emails, messages to ISIS leaders and coordination for the phony videos. So the U.S. is getting outed by Putin. Here's what I think Putin did with Erdogan. And I don't care about correctly pronouncing Erdogan or in Cyrillic, the Air Force Base for NATO. I think Putin made Erdogan an offer. If you make an apology and you make it sincere and you work toward constructive methods with your country and Russia, we'll repair all this. We'll deal whatever, with whatever comes from the United States in regards to terrorism, destabilization, head of state assassinations, financial market turmoil, currency sales, whatever. We'll deal with all that. But turn east and we'll take care of you because we have a longer history between Russia and Turkey than Turkey does with Europe. Erdogan said, I'm there, I'll do it, and he did. And I believe one of the big conditions by Putin was turn your back on ISIS, wash your hands, they're dirty. And I think Erdogan said, okay, Turkey is going to wash its hands of ISIS. And again, Americans do not seem to comprehend the ISIS field headquarters for logistics and battle controls are in the U.S. Embassy in Ankara, Turkey. We're again violating protocol for another embassy. We violated protocol in Libya. How'd that turn out? We're violating it in Turkey. We're also using the, the Air Force Base as a, a center for an attempted coup, coordinating with the, 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 the cleric in the Poconos of Pennsylvania named Gulen, or I don't, know, I don't care how you pronounce his name. It sounds like, it looks like G-U-L-E-N, Gulen. Okay. Um, Turkey is flipping east right now. And the big issue that I see is what's going to happen with the nukes. And it looks like the U.S. has already handled that. We've moved them to other East European locations like Bulgaria and Poland, which really don't know what devil they're dealing with. The other big issue regarding Turkey is what's going to happen with all the heroin that is shipped from the U.S. sponsored production plants in Afghanistan, responsible for between 80 and 90 percent of the world's heroin, including the heroin that involved my niece recently in an overdose. What's going to happen with all the heroin that the U.S. sends through Kosovo to Turkey from Afghan origins? And I think the U.S. is going to solve that easily by just using and abusing the Rammstein base in Germany. You know, th this is so perverse. I just had a, a conversation face-to-face -face with a client a few weeks ago, and the person said to me, Jim, I want to tell you a story about my son. 
this fellow was in his 60s. You know, that, that's my age. So my guess is it had to be someone about his same age. I think it was his brother or brother-in-law, something like that. Anyway, let's just call it his brother. He said, my brother served at an Air Force base in Thailand during the Vietnam War. And I said, oh, that must have been interesting. A lot of, a lot of movement of dangerous weapons and, you know, ordnance that ended up in Cambodia and Laos. And, and he said, oh, yeah, but the point of my story, Jim, is that the – the Air Force Base, I can't remember the name of it, he said it's a gigantic Air Force Base the U.S. runs in Thailand, very near the, the, the uh, I think, the Laotian border. I'm not sure of the geography there, but very close for all the, the runs. And he said, this Thailand base had a distinction. They handled the dead bodies. And uh, I knew where he was going to go with this. I said, oh, yeah, 100 pounds of heroin in every coffin. He said, exactly. Every coffin had 100 pounds of heroin. He said, here are some of the other little signals that are so important on the detail side. He said, imagine, you know, moving a coffin. You'd think, well, they get the privates and the grunts and the sergeants and get them all there working up a sweat in the Thailand sun. He said, no, no, no. You had to be captain or higher to even be in a certain region a certain area of the Air Force Base that handled the coffins. And I said, why was that? And he said, because they're loading in the heroin. Wow. 100 pounds per coffin. And he said, if you, he said it was a real shock because my brother, my brother occasionally wandered where he wasn't supposed to, just, just you know, going for a walk, and he get, got stopped by some colonel. I said, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm just going for a walk. He turned around. This is a restricted area. Why is a coffin area restricted? And they say, well, it's respect to the families involved so that there's no desecration of bodies. 100 pounds of heroin. Then he went on to say, Jim, did you ever see the, the movie with Russell Crowe, Russell Crowe, the Australian, and Denzel Washington about the Thailand Air Force Base? I said, no, I missed that one. I see a lot of movies. I did not see that Denzel Washington movie. He said, Denzel acted as a ranking U.S. Army military officer. Oh, American they, gangster. American gangster, yes, that was it. That was it, yeah. yes. And he said, that's where the heroin came from, that they loaded 100 pounds per coffin. And I, and I said to him, you know, that's a real reason not to dislike a lot of casualties. And we only had 50,000. Gosh, we could have had more. And he said, yeah, and, and beware that it was the the lower class that largely died in Vietnam. Point is, uh, Turkey has nukes. They're being moved to Eastern European, other locations. Tur Turkey has a lot of heroin moving through it, going, going to the other Western European cities and, and countries where they have significant income and drug problems. I think that's going to be all rerouted through Germany's Rammstein base, and I made some comments in a recent interview, and I got some more contact us commentary uh, from a, a very smart German fellow. And he said, Jim, the part about Germany you may not fully appreciate is that the, the powerful, no, the, the centers of power in the German government and hierarchy are all subservient to Washington. He said, I'm referring to the chancellor's office. That's the president. Yeah. I'm referring to their intelligence network their press networks, and certain members of the parliament. They're all beholden to Washington with, with you know, uh, loyalty oaths that supersede their oath to serve in the German political offices. So we, we've made Germany a vassal state. It's going to be very difficult for it to uproot. And I made the comment that the industrial captains are just going to ignore the political, the political leadership. And he said that that could very well happen. He said, I liked your term of industrial captains. You know, it's the executives, so the ones who are trying to maintain business course, trying to keep the export trade strong, trying not to lose their Russian business to China. Well, Europe is on the brink of a financial meltdown. We see banks are charging customers, Jim, to hold their cash in negative interest rate. I mean, what kind of world is... That, you've got Euro area shutdowns putting onuses on Germany as Brexit risks gather. Of course, we see that. You know, you see these Swiss partners, these offshore 
wind farms. I mean, it's just a gong show in Europe, isn't it? It is. I, I like to make some comments about the negative interest rate. Yes, please. I mean, I, I made a name for myself in a certain way back in 2003 before the hat trick letter when I wrote a four-part series called Ass Backwards Economics to point out how U.S. economic policy is very destructive, how things are not working as we want, and how propaganda is used to, to falsely describe what we're doing so people don't understand. But the negative interest rate, I think, is far more complex than we're told. Why do the bankers do that? What do the bankers say for their motive to have a negative interest rate? They actually say, we're trying to push money out of the safe haven of the banks so that it'll go out into the economy and be productive with business capital and, and, and you know, planting equipment, buying things, starting businesses. Well, if that's the case, why don't the banks lend more to the commercial sector? There's the contradiction. They don't. So their reason of pushing money out of the idle safe haven into the capitalist centers is a lie. They don't lend themselves. So why are they claiming that that's the motive? Well, if that's the motive, they should be working more toward commercial lending. Should they not? This is a basic contradiction that, again, the low IQ types that run around so commonly in our country don't focus on. I'm not one of them. I've got a three-digit IQ. Okay, so there's more to it. What is the motive? I, I, I did my dismissal. This, these are the reasons why I don't think we're having the negative interest rates. Well, what are they for? Okay, take a, a look now. Focus attention on the spread. The spread from the 10-year bond down to, say, the lower level maturities. And it gets kind of complex because U.S. Treasury bonds are, are not really negative, but they're near zero, and they're so close to zero that you might, I just call them zero. But why would the banks want to offer negative rates? And I believe it's to try to preserve as much as they can the difference between the 10-year bond yield and their cost on savings interest yield. By going negative, they're extending that spread. So if we have 1.5% on the 10-year, it's possible for the spread to be more than 1.5% because they went negative on the short end, their short end, their short end that pays a cost. Okay, but there's more. The interest rate swap derivative. This is, again, something that the American public does not have much familiarity with, and they need to. Anyone who thinks, oh, gosh, we're going to see a rise in the interest rates because we have to. <laughs> I, I love that reason. Well, we have, have to because that's normal. I say, well, this is not normal. We don't have to because we're nowhere near normal. We're not going to see an interest rate hike for two very good reasons. The interest rate swap derivative is used by the big banks in order to fabricate phony demand for the treasury bonds because there are not many buyers out there. Most countries are selling them. So how does the U.S. government finance a $1 trillion annual deficit? They don't without the interest rate swap derivative. So how does that operate. I don't want to get into a long explanation about how the IRS swap, not, not, in, not income tax, but the interest rate swap derivative. I don't want a long explanation. But the feeder tubes to it are the short bonds, the short treasury bills. If they're running at near zero, then they've got a free feeder system for their bond factory. And I guarantee you, any factory loves zero cost input feeder systems. If they raise the cost of the feeder system to the fabricated 10-year treasury bond, they destroy the entire machinery. So they're not going to do that. I think they're turning the rates negative in order to facilitate even more fabricated, phony, long-term treasury bond demand. By going more negative, maybe it's beneficial on the feeder system 
instead of costing them a very small amount of money, maybe they're earning a small amount of money by using the feeder tubes of the short-term bonds called treasury bills. Unbelievable. And I think the U.S. is starting to use a whole lot more their European and Japanese connections because recently the Japanese connection on the treasury bill went rather negative, whereas it's not negative in the United States. So when you factor in the currency conversion, for that whole arbitraged element to the treasury bond that's purchased in Tokyo, it's now running at a negative rate. How, what's the European connection? Well, it's the BLICs. It's Belgium, Luxembourg, Ireland, Cayman, and Switzerland. They have an equal volume of treasury bond purchases as the Fed does. So in effect, the Fed has doubled their treasury bond purchases while lying to the public. They do it through the back door. And how, do, how for instance, does Luxembourg buy treasury bonds? Well, they do a swap of the dollars with the Central Bank of Europe and the United U.S. Fed, and in comes all the ample money, and they buy treasury bonds with it that stays off the Fed's books. So we're exporting Zimbabwe giant tubes of acid all across Europe. This cannot it's, end well. It's not going to end up with, with the U.S. system just, just breaking from lack of attention. No, there's too much attention, and it's all corrupt. It's all market rigging. I mean, there isn't a big market in, in, in the U.S. or the West that, that's not rigged by the Fed, Wall Street, and the Exchange Stabilization Fund operated by the U.S. Department of Treasury. It used to be a, a fund, the ESF, Exchange Stabilization Fund, it used to be a fund where they, they just wanted to make sure that the dollar didn't have a lot of fluctuations and variations and volatile moves that might interfere with our nation. And then they decided, well, gee, we can use this and rig markets, and Wall Street can make some extra money. Uh, one, one of my favorite news stories, Sheila, is to mention back in 1991, remember the Bank of Japan went to the zero interest rate and, and heavy quantitative easing, 1991. Well, the, they were still back then a vassal slave state. So why would they do that? Well, you could take a look at some of their previous stimulus projects, and there were lots and lots of bridges and roads to nowhere. I'm not making this up. They had bridges and big roads, highways, that had no cars on them. But they were great for keeping population working, you know, working class at the labor market, keeping them busy, keeping them paid, and uh, money flew th all through the system. Why would the Japanese do that? It wasn't so much to cover all the costs from the failed stimulus plans. It was Wall Street that told them, go to zero percent, because we want to borrow the zero percent and invest in the U.S. stock market. It's called the yen carry trade. Borrow at zero percent invest in, say, treasury bonds, earning 6%. What's the profit there, Sheila? Is it not 6% a year? Right. If they can engineer a two-year trend of a, of a positive rally, they can load on 20 to 30 to 1 leverage with bond futures contracts and make 20 times the 6% per year. That's doubling their money on hundreds of billions borrowed at zero percent. Is that not a profitable venture? <laughs> wow. Okay, but what it had as a consequence was to screw up the Japanese economy. But that's okay. They're a vassal slave state. We don't care if they're wrecked, because if they're wrecked, China won't want to adopt them. Oy, oy, oy. We're coming into, of course, we're halfway into August. What do you see on the horizon here for August, September here, Jim? On the financial front, what's coming in the rest of August? I think that the big news that's going to happen in the next couple of weeks will be primarily continuation stories of what's already going on now. We've got to finish up the Olympics. And by the way, three American swimmers were held up at gunpoint, including uh, Lotchke, the, the rival of Phelps. And I'm not surprised about that at all. I thought there'd be one a day. Rio is just chock full of crime. It's an amazing crime center. But the continuation story for Turkey, uh, we're getting more and more fleshed out details of enormous 
trade deals between Russia and Turkey. They're resuming the Turkish stream pipeline for Gazprom. They got back online the big nuclear generating plant in Turkey. They're going to be continuing with the gigantic natural gas storage facility in Turkey. Russia's going to do everything they can to try to talk their citizens into taking vacations again in Turkey. But you know, I don't blame a Russian citizen who's dealing with a long winter and a short summer for not wanting to go to a Turkish hotel at this time because the coup has made it a little bit dangerous still. But it's, it's quieting down. And I, I don't know how it's going to turn out regarding the coup. I think we're going to see a, uh, a massive purge in Turkey of anyone involved and, and maybe some very public executions of some people involved, including the top Turkish general who was at the NATO base following U.S. orders. I think they're going to execute that fellow. Uh, he had that look on his face when he was being arrested. Um, we're going to see continuation stories about the decline in the German banking system. They're, they can't put this off. The, the Germans are going to have to find a way to bail out a lot of their banks. And it's going to cause an enormous problem, Sheila, because the Germans are telling Italy, you can't bail out your banks with a, you know, a, a universal bailout plan, a program. You can't do a uniform plan in Italy without doing a bail-in yeah. confiscation of accounts. And, and anyone who thinks that Italy has not yet done bail-ins is just dead wrong. I've got some clients who who have friends in Italy, and they've said in, in Banco um, Monto de Pachi, they have some friends who've had 100% confiscations of their private accounts. And there's a lot of other stories going on around Italy related to severe catastrophic losses at the personal level with suicides. But those are more convertible bonds that the shyster banks convinced naive investors into taking because, gee, you can earn a 4% yield on that. Right. But they didn't read the fine print. They didn't understand what it would mean. And they lost everything. They didn't get the 4% and 5%. They lost 100% because the bank entered failure mode. Okay, the, the Germans have this dilemma. They want to fix immediately a bank in Germany called Bremen Landesbank in Bremen. It's multi-billion in the hole. They want to fix it. They don't want to fail. So they're talking about a number of banks in Germany that are going to get a fix. And the question is, is that a systemic uniform applied bailout across the German banking system? And the Germans are starting to say, no, no, it's just a couple, but it's more than a couple. And if it's more than a couple, then the EU rules kick in that say you have to do bail-in confiscations. You know, it's not 100% like in, like in parts of Italy. It, it's more like the 30% that uh, was set up in the Cyprus model from back in 2013. Right. All right. The Germans are stuck. They want to fix their own, and they want to do it without bail-ins, and whatever Germany does, Italy wants the same, because Italy doesn't want the bail-ins either. In Italy, it would turn into a revolution. Well, Jim, what, what, what's your take on the World Bank approving China to use SDRs as the RMB continues to grow in global use? This is a really slippery story. Yeah. Well, a few weeks ago, we know the IMF had entered into that agreement with China to allow it to begin financing SDR bonds, and once an audit's completed, well, we know what happens with the reserve systems, right? So if the World Bank is publicly giving their nod to China, I mean, that's rather significant, isn't it? When they m made room for the Chinese RMB, you know, the renminbi, it's, it means China, it's Chinese for people's money. It's a Chinese yuan currency. When the International Monetary Fund has their currency basket. They call it the SDR, the Special Drawing Rights. It's a maintained, managed basket with fixed weights in it. When they invited the Chinese RMB currency to come in and participate and be part of the group, they're going from four currencies to five. The dollar, euro, pound, and yen now has another brother 
called the RMB. So the next big question is, what are the weights for the, the yuan, RMB, and it's 11%. That begs the question, who gave up the 11%? And I've come to learn, I, you know, I'm trying to be diligent and not make errors here. I made an error about two or three months ago. I thought that the dollar was going to give up ground. No, it's the euro. The euro dropped by something like 9% in its weight. So of the 11%, the RMB now will have the bulk will come from the euro. And I think there's 1% off the, the pound and 1% off the dollar. So where's the impact going to be felt? Euro bonds. So any big bank in those countries, in the, in the major na national banking systems, any big bank is going to say, all right, we need to dump some euro bonds and grab the Chinese government bonds. They're not going to be dumping treasury bonds. So it's not a really big deal. It's a big deal to euro bonds. And whatever euro bonds are dumped, you can be guaranteed that Prince Draghi of the Euro Central Bank will lap them up like a dog does its vomit. Okay, what does that really mean? What are the consequences for the IMF to have a, a whole lot more of Chinese government bonds? Well, to begin with, China doesn't have a lot of floated RMB-based bonds in the world banking system or in the global markets at all. Right. They've been running surpluses. They've been running trade surpluses of $20 billion a month with the United States. They don't have giant debt. They have a giant surplus. They have $3.7 trillion in Forex reserves. What does that mean? These are foreign exchange reserves in the form of bonds that earn interest. They're foreign denominated sovereign bonds in their reserves. They don't have a big debt. So the Chinese are going to have a problem. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of funny. <clears throat> they, they're going to have a problem with having an inadequate number, inadequate volume of bonds to float around the world to even make up the, the 11% that's designated in the IMF. They don't have enough debt. They're not unsuccessful enough, Sheila. Just yeah. like Germany. Germany has problems all the time lately. They've got big demand for their bonds because they're considered full of integrity. But they don't have much debt. They're not sufficiently unsuccessful to provide enough bonds to satisfy the demand. So they're running negative on the rates to discourage this. Okay, the Chinese have another challenge. And that has to do with bank reserves and trade payments. I mean, I've been, I've been hoping and expecting that the Chinese would make big gains with bank reserves, with RMB denomination, and with trade payments in RMB terms. And they're not doing all that well. They've got progress, but now I, mean, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but I, I believe that of all the, the reserve assets in the global banking system, only about 3% are Chinese RMB denominated. Okay. I, I'm not certain of that figure, but I think that is it. Now, switch to trade payments. The dollar, the euro, and the pound dominate. The Chinese are making ground, making progress with trade payments done in RMB terms. They're starting to demand it more. But my understanding is that they're only about 6% of all trade payments in RMB terms. If that's the case, how on earth did the Chinese RMB ever get to be anything remotely like a secondary reserve currency? 3% in banking reserves, 6% trade payment, woefully inadequate to be a secondary global reserve currency. And remember back 15 years ago, the big talk was the euro bond is going to be a important secondary reserve currency in the forex reserves right and it has been but now i think we're going to see a, a change why did the imf have the euro give up the most ground in order to make room for the rmb i believe it might have been something like the dollar people saying not on my watch take it out of your hide euro 
And the Euro folks said, well, we don't want to. And the United States said, we have NATO bases and Langley agents all through your continent. Do it. And that's why I think the IMF did it, because they are a vassal office. Very ugly stuff. So, you know, what, what are some of the, the big events going to come up in the next month, next three weeks? I think we're going to see more about Turkey. I think we're going to hear more about Germany. The German banks are not going to wait for September. Erdogan and Putin are not going to wait for September. They're going to do everything they can to get the Turkish big pipeline, Turkish stream, to get that thing moving. And I, I just read today that the canceled South Stream that was to go through Bulgaria. I think we're going to see more and more evidence coming out in the next couple of weeks, three weeks, about the Treasury bond problems. We had a big event last week with the Bank of England actually offering a reverse repo where they wanted the bonds from the bank, the financial sector. They wanted the bonds and there was an inadequate amount of bonds given to them. Never happened before in history. I'm not talking about the Bank of England trying to sell bonds. I'm talking about the other way around. The Bank of England was trying to buy bonds, gilts, from the financial centers of England. There might have been higher yielding bonds being held by the financial center in London. So they didn't want to give it up for the near zero that the Bank of England was making the standard in their benchmark. They wanted to hang on to their, their good, higher yielding bonds. Also, since the interest rate is lower, many of these financial firms, whether they're pension or insurance or whatever, they're trying to match up with a, a well-hedged risk. They need the interest-bearing asset, not just for income, but to balance the weights of their asset portfolios. It's asset management at its finest. And the, the Bank of England probably just figure, oh, we can run roughshod over them. And they didn't. So there's a lot of shock that's taken place in the last week regarding BOE repo failure. Never happened before. So we're starting to see things happen in the bond market in, in, at important nations. We're not talking about, you know, Portugal here. We're talking about England. I mean, we know one thing, Jim, there's total all-out economic insanity is unfolding. It's not looming. It's unfolding as we speak. And we are certainly going to see some interesting things play out in the next few weeks for sure in into September. For the new listeners, tell them how they can sign up for your hat trick letter. The website is called www.goldenjackass.com. No hyphens in there, just goldenjackass.com. Well, and I highly recommend your newsletter. Not only is it very cutting edge, but, you know, there's a lot of high-priced chicanery that goes on with these bought and paid for minions. They're not going to show you what's really going on, and no one lays it out quite like Jim Willie, folks. I highly recommend you do sign up for his newsletter. And, Jim, congratulations on 12 years at this. No one lays it out quite like you do, Jim. Thank you so much for your time in coming on the program, and I do hope you come back and see us real soon. Well, it's a pleasure being on, and uh, you can count on my coming back. Thanks, Jim. Folks, that was Jim Willie, goldenjackass.com. His information is linked on today's bio, August 15th, 2016. People have been emailing me asking, Sheila, when is the book out? The publisher told us it's going to be released sometime this month. I'm really hoping this Friday. Please be patient. I can promise you the book is going to be worth it. If you haven't done so, click on Power Prayers, Warfare That Works. I'm telling you what, it's going to change your life. Trust Carl and I when we say this book, wow, it's going to be amazing. And I'm very excited to get it in your hands. And don't forget to sign up for my YouTube channel and my social media. Why? Not because I'm a big fan of social media, but I do post a lot of information there. And I do keep you up to date on guests coming on the program. You can see my social media icons at the very top right-hand side of weekendvigilante.com. Hey, and if you want a guest to come on the show, well, simply go to the contact tab at my website as well. We have a fantastic lineup this week. Augusto Perez is coming to visit us and many other amazing guests. It's going to be fantastic. So 